My name's Dan Snow and I want to tell you about History Hit TV. It's like the Netflix for history. Hundreds of exclusive documentaries and interviews with the world's best historians. We've got an exclusive offer available to fans of Timeline. If you go to History Hit TV, you can either follow the information below this video or just Google History Hit TV and use the code TIMELINE, you get a special introductory offer. Go and check it out. In the meantime, enjoy this video. The Tornado GR-1 is the bomber currently used by the Royal Air Force. It's got everything a bomber should have, range, speed and power. And it can deliver a devastating blow with pinpoint accuracy. Bombs gone, bombs gone. Okay, okay. Now, finalizing now. In 1914, German Zeppelins bombed England. These giant airships took a whole day to reach Britain, but flying at high altitude kept them beyond the reach of British aircraft. By the time they were over their targets, factories and docks, it was dark. From such a height, it was inevitable that many of their bombs missed their target and instead killed and injured innocent civilians. For the first time in nearly a thousand years, the terror and horror of modern war reached out to British cities and their populations many miles from the battlefield. The Zeppelins had to be stopped. Scared me to death. I ran, I was on before them. And uh, as though Tommy Mother, they're here, they're here. And they'd go down into the cellar. And of course, these fellas scampered up because they knew, never knew whether another one might be falling. The Royal Naval Air Service had been recently formed and been given the job of defending mainland Britain. But their aircraft were too fragile to shoot down the Zeppelins in flight. Instead, they mounted the first British bombing mission against Zeppelin factories in Germany. But the aircraft they used were too light to carry bombs big enough to do any real damage to a strategic target like this. The Royal Flying Corps, on the other hand, were performing what would later be described as ground support by attacking targets useful to the army. By lashing bombs to the underside of their reconnaissance aircraft, they could bomb tactically important targets such as trenches and troop trains. But successes were few. The RFC flew 141 raids during the Battle of Neuve-Chapelle in 1915, and only three of them were really effective. To the army, bombing looked like a waste of time. Spotting for the artillery was much more useful. The bombs were too light, the aircraft too small, and vulnerable to German fighters. The Royal Navy, though, believed that it could extend its strategic role with long-range bombers. The Admiralty wanted a bloody paralyzer to stop the Germans in their tracks. In 1917, they got one. The Handley Page 0100 was a giant, but could fly all the way to Germany with 1,800 pounds of bombs. And they had guns to defend themselves. But doubts in the high command about the value of bombing meant that they were never allowed to fulfill their potential. Then, in the summer of 1917, the Germans began to rain down bombs on London, this time 
from aircraft. The carnage caused public outcry. The heart of the empire was under attack. People felt defenseless. Inter-service bickering meant that neither the RFC nor RNAS could mount any substantial defense. The government had to do something. It did. And in April 1918, the RFC and RNAS were merged to form the Royal Air Force. It must have been a very difficult time indeed for all concerned because the Germans had launched their massive and very nearly successful offensive on the 21st of March and had struck west in considerable force. And here is the, this new flying service being formed 10 days later on the 1st of April. Major General Hugh Trenchard, who'd commanded the RFC in France, was the RAF's first commander. But even he had doubts whether the time was right. He believed the duty of the RAF was to support the army on the Western Front in France. But continued sniping on the home front forced Trenchard to resign within three months. He was sent back to France to command the independent force of bombers which had been specially created to bomb Germany. By the end of the war, Trenchard had become a convert to strategic bombing. In the periods of 1920s and 1930s, the perception started to grow that there was a better way of going to war than going to war along a similar line to World War I. And the new way of war, therefore, was to use air power to gain your advantages. And if air power was going to be as effective as we wanted, then it was clear that it had to have all the dimensions, the long range, the potency, and so forth. And many of the people writing of the time reinforced the public perception that air power was going to be this new weapon of war. This replica of Vimy shows how far the bomber developed in four years. Flying from bases in France, the Germans could easily reach and bomb London. But for the RAF to get to Berlin, with enough bombs to do some real damage, bigger and more powerful bombers were needed. The Vimy was ideal. Although smaller than earlier bombers, it was more powerful and could carry up to 2,500 pounds of high explosives over 1,000 miles. The Vimy also helped to expand the physical boundaries of aviation. In 1919, Alcock and Brown crossed the Atlantic in under 17 hours. A few weeks later, Ross and Keith Smith flew to Australia in under a month. The world was getting smaller and the bombers flying further. That was a milestone in terms of the ability of air power to reach out and attack targets at great strategic ranges. So now, for the first time, anywhere in the enemy country could be attacked at will. And that obviously had a deterrent and a coercive effect. Even so, the Royal Navy still thought they ruled the waves, even though their mightiest ships, the Dreadnoughts, had been confined to port in the last years of the First World War because they had become too expensive to risk. Then, in 1921, an American, General Billy Mitchell, blew a vast hole in their composure by bombing and sinking the captured German battleship, the Ostfriesland. The supremacy of the big battleships was over, as many navies around the world would find out in the next war. But it was now peacetime, so the armed forces could not expect unlimited amounts of money to develop new weapons. Aircraft were expensive, and the army and the navy were determined to keep their slice of the defense cake. Lack of investment meant that many elderly aircraft types would remain in service well into the 30s. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, the RAF had to use whatever aircraft it could get to carry out its policing duties. Light bombers, like the Hawker Hart, were proving very useful at controlling local rebellions. The aircraft could fly over deserts and mountains, drop a bomb, 
and be back at base in time for tea. These same operations would have taken the army weeks, if not months, to complete on foot. The immense savings were just what the Treasury wanted, and so the RAF was given the job of policing the Empire. The pilots had to get used to very different conditions. The dust level was such that you couldn't see very far. You could, when you looked down, the dust was brown and the ground was brown, and it was very difficult to see what it was. And as you were navigating yourself, no navigator, as you're map reading, it could be, could be a problem. The RAF was fighting rebel tribesmen who were unused to modern warfare and had no way of combating aircraft. They were given warning of impending bombing raids by a leaflet drop which reduced casualties. Even so, pilots who fell into enemy hands had to rely on a piece of paper to save them from a grim fate, castration. You had pasted into the side of the airplane. We wanted in our parachutes in case we had to bail out. They wouldn't agree with that, or somebody might pinch a parachute, where they promised vast sums of money to anybody who brought you in. Uh, and in that relation, they were very big sums indeed, and you got paid, they got paid according to how complete you were when you arrived. If you were fully fit, uh, they got a lot of money. If you were dead, they got a great deal less. And if you were shall we say, mutilated, they got somewhere in between. The piece of paper itself was known as a ghoulie chit. The conditions took their toll on the aircraft, but new replacements were hard to come by, and they had to be cheap to produce. The Hawker Hind, which went into service in 1935, was a classic example of the problems the RAF faced during this period. It was cheap to produce, because it was based on the proven heart airframe, and so no new manufacturing facilities were needed. As a result, it won export orders from air forces around the world. This particular example was brought back from the Afghan Air Force after being in active service well into the 1940s. But essentially, the Hind was no better than its 10-year-old predecessor. They called it a light bomber, but was only really capable of fulfilling this role against the tribesmen. Yet over the next few years, virtually every bomber pilot would make his first flight in a hind. In 1933, war was in the air. Adolf Hitler walked out of the Geneva Disarmament Conference and announced that Germany would rebuild the Luftwaffe. This was in direct contravention of the Treaty of Versailles, which Hitler treated with contempt. The RAF began a frantic period of expansion. New monoplane bombers were built, the first of which was the Vickers Wellesley. Barnes Wallace designed this aircraft using a lattice arrangement called geodetics for the airframe. This made it lighter which gave it the strength to carry much larger payloads than any other bomber. It had a huge wingspan, double that of the Hind, which gave it exceptional range. This was demonstrated when three of them flew non-stop from Cairo to Australia. The struggle to modernize the RAF gained a new sense of urgency when the German Condor Legion unleashed a murderous onslaught on civilians during the Spanish Civil War bombing and slaughtering indiscriminately. Well, essentially, it reinforced the perceptions, not only in the public mind, but also in the minds uh, of the air marshals, that one could actually use air power now to go and influence the outcome of a war directly. And for the first time, we started to see these, these developments that made people believe uh, the next war would use bombing first and foremost and uh, military forces, surface forces, were going to be relegated to a second, a second best option. The Legion was equipped with Germany's latest aircraft and the crews relished their first taste of combat. The Nazi war machine was getting valuable experience. Barcelona and Guernica were torn apart by bombers and any lingering doubts about the potency of the bomber as a weapon 
evaporated as these and other cities crumbled. By 1939, Bomber Command was rapidly expanding with new aircraft like the Wellington, in readiness to stop the Nazis in their tracks. But it needed a vast influx of trained aircrew. Some would come from the Auxiliary Air Force, others from the newly formed RAF Volunteer Reserve. The rest from Britain's dominions and allies, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and Rhodesia. Many were being trained on hind biplanes, but a lack of enough modern aircraft meant that at the outbreak of war, 17 out of the 55 squadrons that formed the front line had to be withdrawn to train the new recruits. On September the 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. War was declared and Bomber Command went on the offensive from the first days. However, Hitler had at last agreed to sign a treaty which protected the German heartland from being bombed. Naval targets were not included. So small groups of twin-engine bombers, unprotected by friendly fighters, flew in broad daylight to attack German shipping and naval installations. The Blenheims made easy targets for the Luftwaffe. The Blenheim is a lovely aeroplane to fly, but it's about as damage resistant as an electric light bulb. I'd had no self-sealing tanks or anything, and if you got hit by something or other, you, practically speaking, you had it. During the Battle of France, the British bomber force was decimated. Even worse than the loss of aircraft was the dreadful loss of well-trained pilots whose experience would be sorely missed in the battles to come. I thought the Blenheim, at that time, one of the most wonderful modern bombers of the day, Little did I realize that it was rapidly becoming obsolescent and the type of operations that it was being sent on were incurring very heavy losses. However, Bomber Command continued the offensive by concentrating their attacks on the French harbors holding German invasion barges. At the same time, they were receiving a long stream of contradictory orders. The Navy wanted them to bomb ships, the Army to bomb tank factories. Nobody could agree what targets they should hit. Later attacks concentrated on the invasion fleet in the coastal targets uh, and also Wilhelmshaven, and they were relatively successful. But there was one problem, and the problem was that the loss rates by attacking by day were going to be unsustainable. It, therefore, a decision was taken quite early on that we would have to switch to night operations. Now, unfortunately, when you navigate by day, you can, of course, map read your way to the target. When you navigate by night, you have to use astro navigation, which is inherently unreliable. One other type of operation undertaken by Bomber Command during 1941 was that of circuses. We were used very much as bait for fighters. We would perhaps go with a large fighter escort over northern France at about eight, 9,000 feet, uh, perhaps a dozen of us to bomb a target in northern France, the idea being we were the bait to get the German fighters up. Forcing the Germans to defend themselves meant that fighters were prevented from reaching the Eastern Front, where they would have been crucial in the war against Russia. 1942 was a vital year for the whole future of Bomber Command and its strategic offensive. Air Marshal Sir Arthur Harris was appointed its new Commander-in-Chief. He was a natural leader whose force of personality brought respect and dedication from all ranks. Air Marshal Harris, chief of bomber faith in the power of the heavy bomber to destruct the enemy's vitals. That faith is now being justified. He had a paltry force of about 500 bombers of which no more than 250 were serviceable at any one time. And his experience at group level had taught him that precision bombing with large formations of aircraft was simply not possible. His views were backed up by a report prepared in the autumn of 1941. It concluded that only 8% of aircraft on previous raids had actually bombed within a 75 square mile area around the target. Yes, it was deadening really. You knew that um, you were 
perhaps uh, close to the target because you you navigated as best you could, but um, you knew that uh, within five miles or so you were hopeless. And in fact, um, the most damage we did to the German war effort was killing their cows in the fields around. Also, the growing strength of German night fighters and anti-aircraft batteries made the job hazardous in the extreme. To cap it all, casualties on previous operations had left the command woefully short of train crews. But the bomber offensive had to continue. At this time, it was the only way that Harris had to wage war against Germany and provide support for the Russian armies on the Eastern Front and hard-pressed Allied troops in North Africa. He saw it necessary to go and bomb the German economy. But because of the inaccuracy of his bomber force, the only way in which he could bomb anything uh, profitably was to go against the center of centers of population, which contained all the factors of production, the labor, for example, the industries, for example, and the lines of communication, for example. And by bombing the center of a city, he was going to get all those factors of production. Now, he believed that if you took out 60 of the critical cities in Germany, you would bring Germany to its knees. And indeed, had the Germans not taken countermeasures, there are strong grounds for thinking he would have been right. Production will now cease and no more of these grand old warriors will be built. The equipment situation was already being improved by the delivery of four engine heavies with greater range and bomb load. The Lancaster was undoubtedly the finest bomber of the war. It had a normal payload of 14,000 pounds, three times the load of a Wellington and could be adapted to carry the enormous 22,000 pound Grand Slam bomb. It had the range to penetrate deep into German territory and attack targets that had previously been unreachable. And its Merlin 20 engines gave it enviable speed and reliability. And the Wellington and the, uh, the Stirlings were operating over, over the other side at about um, 10,000 feet. And uh, we could make 15,000 feet uh, with a full bomb load. So uh, whether it was true or not, it seemed to us that uh, the higher, the fewer. And uh, mind you, the flak could get up there, but obviously the, uh, the errors in aiming and so on were that much safer. The Lancaster's baptism of fire was a raid on Augsburg on the 17th of April, 1942. The aim was to damage the MAN diesel engine factory. Um, it was a very compact factory and uh, an ideal target. And the, um, the real reason, of course, apart from damaging the uh, war effort, was that uh, we were suffering terribly from uh, the U-boat campaign, and it, we weren't far from starvation. And so uh, they called upon the Air Force to uh, damage the U-boat engine production. Harris wanted to show Bomber Command's capabilities. It was the first deep penetration raid into Germany, and to prepare, the crews completed a week's low-level flying training but nothing could prepare them for the shock they would receive at the briefing when their target was revealed. We went into uh, the briefing room and uh, saw the usual tape from base to the target, uh, which stretched all the way down to southern Germany. And everybody roared with laughter. Obviously, they're pulling our legs in a uh, and that was the first uh, long raid, um, and uh, the first daylight, too, with the Lancaster. So uh, when they convinced us that they were serious, uh, we all wrote our little letters of goodbye to our families and uh, went to lunch, and that was that. <laughs> 
lived up to their fears. Of the 12 Lancasters that took part, only five returned. In the dark, a large figure put his arm around my shoulders as I went into the, uh, the briefing hut. And I used some rather foul language and said, I don't want to do that sort of thing again. And it wasn't until we got into the light inside that I realized it was the air officer commanding. <laughs> Augsburg had also been one of the first operations where a new electronic navigation aid was used. G was a revolutionary system that used radio waves to plot an aircraft's course on a screen. Although not perfect, it represented a huge advance over the previous navigational systems based on a compass and the stars. G was very good, very accurate, and uh, we were very happy to have it because it helped us to get back to base at times too. But uh, the Germans eventually caught on, despite the fact that um, the G charts, which were used in conjunction with this radio uh, os oscilloscope, the charts were kept in a tubular oven. Uh, and if, if you were in any danger of crashing or landing over the other side, you pressed a button which would cause these uh, charts to burst into flames. But obviously the Germans did get onto it and uh, they began jamming. But Harris believed that the quickest way to destroy Germany's war effort was to hit it with as many bombers as possible. On the night of May the 26th, 1942, over 1,000 bombers, virtually every serviceable front line and training aircraft and bomber command dropped nearly 1,500 tons of bombs on industrial facilities around Cologne. The damage was enormous and widespread, and compared to previous raids, a great success. However, flying in pitch black meant that identifying targets for such large formations was a problem. The answer was the Pathfinder Force. Formed in August 1942, their role was to locate and mark targets by dropping colored flares. The introduction of the Mosquito Bomber gave the Pathfinders the perfect aircraft they needed for the job. Here was an aeroplane which could fly comfortably on one engine. Now, the previous twin-engine aircraft, you struggled, if you had an engine failure, you struggled to keep it in the air. The Mosquito was fantastic, fast, uh, and uh, initially, of course, we used it in very much in the low-level role, which previously the Blenheims had been done. And then, uh, uh, that role continued in the two group, but when we went into the Pathfinders, from flying as low as possible in them, we were now flying as high as possible. Using a new radar system called OBO, they were able to fly way above the bomber formations, mark the target, and get away at high speed. America had joined the war in 1941. They were now sending over hundreds of bombers and thousands of aircrew to join the bombing campaign. By early February 1943, Bomber Command had been given new orders from the combined chiefs of staff. The progressive destruction and dislocation of the German military, industrial and economic system and the undermining of the morale of the German people to a point where their capacity for armed resistance is fatally weakened. For four months, Germany's industrial might was attacked by the Americans by day and bomber command at night. During the Battle of Hamburg, the largest port in Europe, a lethal cocktail of high explosive and incendiary bombs was used for the first time. Virtually the whole of the city was wiped out by a raging firestorm killing 40,000 citizens. <laughs> 
the bombers had brought terror to Germany. The last of the major targets for 1943 was the great prize, Berlin. But here, the campaign faltered. Over the period from December to March, 600 aircraft were lost to the German capital's strong defences, almost all of them Lancasters. Throughout that year, Bomber Command lost 3,000 aircraft and 20,000 crewmen. In June 1944, the Allies landed in Normandy. Bomber Command provided much needed support to the liberating ground forces as and when they met with stiff opposition. At Caen, the Allied advance faltered. Bomber Command mounted a relentless attack that decimated the city. The bombers were providing close air support for the army on a massive scale. After Normandy, Bomber Command resumed the offensive with Germany's oil industry in its sights. By now, round-the-clock raids had been firmly established in tandem with the US Air Force. What little opposition there was from the Luftwaffe was dealt with by long-range escort fighters like the Mustang, the first with the range to accompany the bombers all the way into the heart of Germany and back. The bombing campaign had achieved its awesome potential to cause destruction on a massive scale. Factories had to be buried into mountains, railways and lines of communication blown apart. Thousands of anti-aircraft guns and crews were kept back from being deployed to the front lines. The bombers could strike with impunity and total air supremacy. The Luftwaffe had run out of fuel. But Germany was still capable of fighting back. V-1 flying bombs followed by V-2 rockets had begun landing on Britain after the Normandy landings. These early cruise missiles brought with them a new terror. Nobody could tell where they might land and they were almost impossible to shoot down. Bomber Command had to do something. They bombed the main rocket factories on the Baltic coast. Uh, we were told at briefing then that if, if we don't destroy it tonight, you'll go tomorrow night and the night after and the night after because we've got to destroy these rockets. But by now, the politicians were questioning the morality of such destruction. They began distancing themselves from the bombing campaign. A totally devastated Germany was not perceived to be in the best interests of the new Europe that would emerge from the rubble. Although they had played a major role, the bombers had failed to force a German surrender. Then, on August 6th, 1945, a single American atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Japan surrendered. Armed with new atomic weapons, the power of the bomber would never again be in doubt. In 1945, with Britain massively in debt, the Labour government ordered wholesale cuts in the armed forces. Bomber command strength in Britain was cut from 97 squadrons to 24 by 1948. It would have to carry on with aging Mosquitoes, Lancasters and Lincolns. Western relations with Soviet Russia were deteriorating and the newly formed North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, was standing by for Soviet aggression. News of the Soviet's detonation of an atomic bomb reverberated around the world. Soon afterwards, with Russian support, the North Koreans invaded South Korea. The world was at the brink of another war, and so a massive Western rearmament program began. 
With no aircraft capable of delivering an atomic bomb, the RAF bought B-29 heavy bombers from America. Renamed the Washington, the B-29s did not impress the RAF. But by the time of the Coronation Review in 1953, the RAF was the largest air force in Europe. Bomber Command had just entered the jet age with the arrival of the English Electric Canberra on frontline duty. Although it was popular with air crews, senior officers were disappointed that they hadn't got the heavy jet bomber they now needed. Although it was subsonic, the Canberra allowed the RAF to deploy a jet bomber to Germany where it would be nearest to the forces of the Warsaw Pact. It was to undertake high-level reconnaissance missions as part of its NATO obligations for many years. But it was the V-bomber that put the RAF firmly back on the world map. It carried Britain's nuclear deterrent and formed the basis of the country's entire defence policy for 12 years. The requirements of the atomic bomb carriers were very exacting. They had to get to the heart of Russia and back. They had to fly high, 50,000 feet way beyond the reach of Soviet ground defences. And they had to be fast enough to outrun enemy defences. The first of the V-bombers, the Vickers Valiant, entered service in 1955. Within two years, four squadrons had been equipped. Deployed in the Suez Crisis in 1956, Valiants dropped conventional bombs on Egyptian airfields. But the V-Force was dealt a massive blow when fatigue problems were found in the Valiants. The damage was too expensive to repair, and within two months, the Valiants were scrapped. The real power of the V-Force was revealed with the arrival of the Avro Vulcan and the Handley Page Victor. The Delta-winged Vulcan was one of the most awesome aircraft ever to serve with the RAF. The Mark B-1 entered service in 1957. But the uprated B-2 was by far the most effective weapon in Britain's nuclear arsenal. The Vulcan had a range of over 3,000 miles, a top speed of close to the speed of sound and a service ceiling of 55,000 feet. The Vulcan was an outstanding aircraft. The day we rolled it out on that Saturday morning and Rolly Falk flew it, the superintendent of flying, and Rolly Falk walked out of that aircraft with just his lone suit on and his leather helmet just as if he was going for an afternoon's drive. When he went down the runway, he lifted it, and we thought, oh no, he's not good, and he was, he was up. He didn't lift the undercarriage, he was airborne two and a quarter hours. Now that two and a quarter hours that he was airborne, he stopped the whole of the traffic in the Manchester area. They'd never seen anything like it, because you know, it was a great Delta bomber, you know, They'd seen the little ones flying, but not a big one like that. They all thought they were being invaded from outer space. Their telephones were red hot. Police cars were tearing about, this, that, the other. Because it was all kept or choice. We'd kept it shut up down there. He came back, he landed it, and he just got out, and he walked, and we all clapped him, and he just raised his hand, and he just walked away as if he'd just been out for an afternoon driving a mini miner. The graceful, crescent-winged Victor was the last V-bomber to enter service and the most adaptable. It had an enormous bay which could carry up to 40,000 pounds of bombs. The Victor would remain in service for many years and was indispensable as a tanker for air-to-air -air refueling of other aircraft well into the 1990s. However, the Soviet Union had also developed its technology to the point that they now have the capability to launch preemptive strikes against the West. Airfields were likely to be among the first targets hit 
And so the V bombers were dispersed to different airfields in the belief that in the event of an attack, at least some of them would get airborne. And because nuclear war would probably come without notice, the quick reaction alert was developed. We had aircraft at four minutes readiness with crews ready to go with weapons on at any time. Uh, I had them in Germany on my Canberra station, two minutes readiness, sleeping beside the aeroplane, ready to go. Uh, and uh, that sort of readiness, uh, which was great for morale because you knew what your requirement was, um, that sort of readiness, I am convinced, was a big factor in the, uh, not, there not being a, a war uh, with, with Russia at the time. At the times of the Cuban crisis, I commanded RAF Bruggen in Germany. And if necessary, we could have gone to war in two to three to four minutes. The aircraft were modified so that all the electronic systems and the four engines could be powered up from a single button. With practice, the V-bombers could be airborne in four minutes on their way to Moscow. The V-force had to carry their nuclear weapons all the way to the target. But the Soviet defences would be tough to get through. So thoughts began to turn to bombs, which could be released hundreds of miles away and then fly on to their targets. American Skybolt air-to-ground missiles fitted with British nuclear warheads seemed like the solution. The V-force would be able to launch them on Moscow from up to a thousand miles away. Then the Americans cancelled the Skybolt project. So the RAF bought blue steel missiles from Avro instead. Although it was British made, blue steel was second choice to Skybolt because aircraft had to be 800 miles nearer their target before the weapons could be released. Before Blue Steel missiles became operational, a Russian missile shot down an American U-2 spy plane flying high over the Soviet Union. This single event radically altered V-force tactics. Vulcans and Victors had an operational altitude of 50,000 feet. The U-2 was shot down at 60,000 feet. Altitude was no longer a defense. After years and years of reaching for the stars, bombers of the V-Force had to relearn hedge hopping and low-level bombing, so shaping aircraft design in the future. Throughout the 60s, the V-Force played a major role in the defense of Britain and indeed Western Europe. But nobody was ever sure if, when the time came, the bombers could actually penetrate the Soviet defense, which now had access to electronic detection systems. It looked as though the manned nuclear bomber had had its day. ground launch ballistic missiles now became the nuclear weapon of choice. The V-bombers carried on until 1969. But finally, with the introduction of the first British nuclear submarines armed with Polaris missiles, the role of strategic deterrence passed back to the Royal Navy. This wasn't quite the end of the V-Force altogether, because a series of aircraft project cancellations forced the RAF to extend the life of these aircraft. The most far-reaching of these cancellations was that of the TSR-2. Designed as a replacement for camera, it was made by BAC, an uneasy alliance formed by the merger of English Electric, Vickers and Bristol. TSR-2 was an extremely advanced bomber which first flew in 1964. However, it was such a complex aircraft to manufacture that the cost soared. The government, under pressure to reduce debts, cancelled the project. This was a major blow to the RAF. 
Huge development costs had already forced the government to delay or cancel other new aircraft, and now its principal strike aircraft had been shot down in flames. American pilots who'd flown it said, if only you'd stop this business of not invented here on both sides of the Atlantic, we could have built the TSR-2 in quantity, and you invent the damn thing. Just like you invented radar, we developed it. The farce went on. The government placed an order for the American F-111, and then canceled that too. Fortunately, the Navy was reducing the size of its aircraft carrier fleet, and so their buccaneer aircraft were transferred to the RAF. Ironically, the RAF had rejected buccaneers some years previously as they'd been expecting TSR-2. Now, they were getting second-hand ones. The buccaneer turned out to be ideally cast in the ultra-low-level strike role. It flew under the radar umbrella, hugging the ground and withstanding the tremendous buffeting at heights of less than 200 feet. It also had a very long life. Still in service during the Gulf War in 1991, 22 years after first entering service. The Buccaneer was the RAF's last purpose-built bomber. In 1968, Bomber Command was merged with Fighter Command to form Strike Command. The future of Britain's strike force now lay with multi-role aircraft like the Tornado designed to satisfy the needs of many nations who also bore the immense development costs. Today, the nature of the dedicated bomber is totally different to the Second World War. New means of guiding bombs to their target mean that the idea of precision bombing is now possible. Long-range bombing can be carried out with cruise missiles, which have the necessary range, speed and accuracy without risking aircraft and crew but they are inflexible and can only be used once. Today's bombers have the flexibility to use different weapons against different targets at all altitudes. For this reason, it is still the pilots and air crews who continue to strike hard and strike sure for the RAF. Okay, Five, four, three, two, one now. Yeah, impact on impact. Yeah. DH. Ships in impact two. Gone. Impact. Stop. Well hit. Battery splash.